Well, good morning. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Ryan Williams. I'm the president of the Claremont Institute. Just started at the beginning of this month, uh, taking over from Michael Pack. Uh, I wanted to thank you all for coming. I'll say a little bit more uh, at lunch about the Claremont Institute and our work, uh, but we'd like to get right into the day's programming. So first, a few logistical items. Uh, there's a program in your gift bags, if you didn't see it already, with our schedule for today. Um, there are snacks, and there's a pad for notes and questions. We'll have three panels today and uh, a lunch program with some remarks and a conversation between uh, Judge Jones and John Eastman. Uh, we understand it's a, it's a full day of programming, so feel free to get up, get coffee, water, take breaks. Um, we'll have some built-in breaks with the program as well. Uh, the restroom, oh, sorry. Could you not hear any of that? Oh, you could. Good. Um, programs in your gift bags, snacks, pads for, uh, for notes. The restroom is down the hall and towards the elevator on the right, and we'll have some built-in breaks today. Um, it's a fine sight to see all of you here today on a Saturday, giving uh, most of your day to this high-minded discussion about the Constitution. Uh, I wanted to thank you for your public spirit. Uh, it uh, makes me hopeful about this country of ours. Um, now I'm going to cede the floor to John Eastman. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him, uh, a friend and colleague, a senior fellow of the Claremont Institute and a board member, the Henry Salvatore Professor of Law and Community Service here at Chapman <coughs> University School of Law. Uh, and he's, of course, the founding director of our Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence at the Claremont Institute. So please join me in welcoming John. Thank you, President Williams. It's, it's a nice ring to it. Um, so, so this past Sunday, we celebrated the 230th <coughs> anniversary of the Constitution. Um, most of our fellow citizens don't even know that that day exists. It's not a holiday that we celebrate uh, like the 4th of July. Um, uh, and why is that? Well, part of it is the nature of the claims we make in the Constitution. Um, the fact that they finished their work on September 17th, 1787, was not the end of the matter. That's not what gave us the Constitution. What gave us the Constitution is what happened in the two years after that. The people came together in ratifying conventions to decide whether this thing was going to be an adequate government to protect the inalienable rights of their life and liberty and pursuit of happiness that are set out in the Declaration of Independence. And it was one of the most extraordinary debates in human history um, that, that produced uh, the ratified Constitution. And so there's no particular day uh, in any of those things where we say, okay, maybe the ninth state that came along and ratified when it finally took effect. But even then, there was some uncertainty of whether we had a new government, because among those first nine was not <laughs> New York. Uh, and without New York, they knew that this was not going to go well. Uh, and so we end up with the Federalist Papers, uh, with Alexander Hamilton and James Madison and John Jay trying to persuade their fellow citizens in New York uh, to cast what was not the legally deciding vote, but was what the practically deciding vote to ratify this Constitution. So there was a whole period of events rather than a single day that gave us this Constitution. Maybe that's why um, we don't celebrate it quite as uh, with, uh, with as much public spirit as we ought. Uh, but there's a, something else going on as well, and that's this increasing notion that the Constitution is a, a relic of the past. Uh, to hear it expressed, expressed in law schools or graduate uh, schools or, or college uh, classes on American government, if they even offer such things. Uh, this was a document given to us by a bunch of dead white men, and we ought to ignore it. In fact, it's fatally flawed because of its embrace of slavery, and not only ought we to ignore it, but we ought to repudiate it in the strongest terms. And so there's some of that uh, going on as well. In fact, in the 1960s and 1970s, the irrelevance of the Constitution itself had grown um, uh, to such an extent that constitutional law textbooks in the law schools had, did not even include a copy of the Constitution uh, in them. Um, now, that changed rather dramatically in the 1980s 
with the uh, or the late 1970s with the advent of the Claremont Institute uh, devoted to recovering the principles of the American founding and restoring them to our rightful and preeminent authority in our national life. And then a few years later, the founding of the Federalist Society, which engaged in a similar mission to recover among lawyers who needed it most, to recover, uh, recover what those basic founding constitutional principles were. And there were grand debates in those days between Ed Meese and, and the entire left wing of the political spectrum, and a significant portion of the conservative side of the political spectrum about the recovery of originalism, uh, that constitutionalism means we ought to be bound by the actual words and text and meaning of the Constitution until we, the people, exercise our sovereign authority to change it. Um, so that's what the mission has been since then. We're honoring today at lunch a judge who's uh, been on the bench since the very beginning of that fight uh, in 1985 and has been a, one of the stalwart leaders uh, in engaging in that recovery of the original understanding of the Constitution mission. Um, but today we're going to talk about three distinct areas uh, where that mission is on a, a collision course with modernity. <laughs> and and uh, we're going to talk about the challenges uh, that exist and, and the opportunities that exist. We, we've got a panel dealing with religious liberty in the confines of uh, various public accommodation statutes. A, a, a panel this afternoon, the first one this afternoon, dealing with a relatively arcane area of the law, administrative law, but a rather dramatic uh, significantly, uh, significance on, uh, on uh, separation of powers, core separation of powers principles in the Constitution. And then we'll close uh, with a panel dealing with uh, a lot of the fights over immigration law, which tie into the role of the states and the role of the federal government, the role of the executive versus the role of the judiciary, all of these things are uh, uh, on the docket, as they say now, uh, in our litigation and in our public discourse. And so we'll try and, uh, through the course of those panels, uh, shed some light about how we ought to be thinking about these current controversies in light of the endearing principles that we find uh, both in the document of 1787 and in that preceding one of 1776 that informs it. Uh, so that's our goal today. I thank you all for participating in it. <coughs> Let me now introduce our first panel, <coughs> which is going to be taking up the question of a case that's on the Supreme Court's dock at this term, uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Human Rights Commission. And we've got three terrific experts um, uh, to, to discuss with us the very uh, significant aspects of that case. Um, uh, uh, Jordan Lawrence is going to go first. Jordan is a senior counsel for the Alliance Defending Freedom. Um, before officially joining that organization in 2001, uh, he was a, an allied attorney of the organization for many years. Uh, uh, and, and by the way, let me just as a, as a sidelight here, this group, the Alliance Defending Freedom, um, uh, which, which used to be the Alliance Defense Fund. I think they changed it because we, we didn't want to be just on defense. We need to go on offense on some of this stuff. Um, uh, the, the, the folks that put that organization together back in the 1990s saw what was coming before many other people in the country did. And they, they put together a very um, well-funded, well-thought-out, uh, broad-based organization that has not just staff attorneys, but allied attorneys throughout the country, numbering in the thousands now, to be uh, in a position to be able to litigate uh, in many of these issues uh, uh, when the other side is engaging in what, what they like to call lawfare, trying to take out some of the core cultural foundations of our, of our society. Uh, Alliance Defending Freedom has been terrific in that, and, and Jordan's been a, 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 a very uh, uh, involved with them at the highest echelons for, for a decade and a half now. He's argued before the Supreme Court, and maybe uh, if, you, if you get implied enough with, uh, with uh, adult beverages in the reception tonight, maybe he'll even tell you about his first one. It's quite a story as he's dealing with uh, a, a, a gallstone or something. Kidney if I, stone. Kidney stone, if I recall. <laughs> um, uh, it, he argued uh, a fairly significant case, uh, Southworth versus Board of Regents of Wisconsin, um, dealing with um, <coughs> whether universities can force uh, students to contribute to campus causes that they disagree with, all these compelled speech things. Then we're going to have John Sullivan. He's currently in the office of the Solicitor General of the Sovereign State of Texas. 
and has drafted amicus briefs for the Supreme Court on behalf of multi-state uh, coalitions um, in several of the cases that are related to the one uh, that's before the Supreme Court right now. Arlene's Flowers case, uh, uh, where uh, a florist decided she did not want to um, uh, confirm or participate in a same-sex wedding, and then the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, which involves the same issues uh, dealing with a baker. Uh, he's previously represented clients on First Amendment issues, both at Supreme Court and a number of the lower courts. Prior to that, he served as a law clerk for uh, some judge down in Texas. Oh, yes, our honoree at lunch today, the Honorable Edith Jones, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Uh, and most significantly, from the perspective of the Claremont Institute, he was a John Marshall Fellow. Uh, now, I, 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 I've still got one minute before this panel is supposed to start, so I'll talk a briefly <laughs> bit about our, our fellowship programs at the Claremont Institute. Um, way back at the beginning, we founded the Publius Fellows Program, named after Publius, the name used by Alexander Hamilton and, and his colleagues drafting the Federalist Papers. And that was aimed at young college students, people thinking about going into the public <laughs> presses, so that they would know something about the principles of America before they started writing about America. Uh, and it was certain, even by then, that they weren't getting it mostly in their university or, or elementary school education. We then launched the Lincoln Fellows Program uh, in the 1990s, aimed at kind of mid-career folks. And then finally, about five or six years ago, we launched the John Marshall Fellows Program. This was a big debate within the Claremont Institute. Could you bring lawyers in and actually educate them? Um, and uh, it, it, it turned out that we can if we're very selective in who we bring in. And, and John Sullivan is one of the examples of why that's been such a successful program. And then fo the, fo the final panelist will be Philip, uh, Philip Munoz. Uh, he was a 1995 Publius Fellow at the Institute and is currently the Tocqueville Associate Professor of Political Science and Associate Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, he teaches a lot on political philosophy, constitutional studies, and American politics. His first book, God and the Founders, Madison, Washington, and Jefferson won the Hubert Morkin Award for the American Political Science Association for the best publication on religion and politics in both 2009 and 10. Now, uh, th this is coming out of the American Political Science Association, so that the fact that they're recognizing a guy that writes the way we like to see people write is rather significant. It must be a, either a terrific book or it was a, a, a prime example of esoteric writing where the APSA didn't understand what you were saying. <laughs> And with that, I will turn it over to Jordan Lawrence to talk about Masterpiece Cake Shop. So with these cases, uh, they're frequently referred to as the photographer, the florist, and the baker. And uh, the uh, one thing that I just want to emphasize, too, was that the first big one was the photographer case, the Elaine photography case out of New Mexico, which I was the lead attorney from day one to the uh, bitter end when the Supreme Court uh, denied cert uh, a couple of years back. And uh, so uh, I had to argue this case before the New Mexico Supreme Court, which was very difficult. I helped out with Masterpiece, gave some advice at the beginning. And, and have you know worked there's been other ADF attorneys that have been the main ones that have been involved in this but they essentially present the same issues of a business owner who is confronted with a situation of providing goods or services that express support for the idea that marriage can be defined to include two men or two women and they uh, say could you go find somebody else I just cannot in good conscience do that and they are sued for discrimination and that's what happened here. Two men came in in July of 2012, Charlie Craig and David Mullins with uh, Charlie's mom. And they said to Jack Phillips, who is a strong Christian, uh, we, uh, they sat down at a cons uh, consulting table and said, uh, we want a, a wedding cake. You, your, your artistry is well known. You want, we want to design it for our same-sex marriage. And he said, I cannot because of my religious beliefs. And he went on now, not at that moment, but in his deposition to talk about how uh, he had, when he started this 24 years ago, that there were certain things that he would not design. And that he said, for example, that he would not design cakes that, uh, that uh, um, I just got to find the right part of my notes here. Uh, Halloween cakes, I know, is one that's coming to mind. 
things that express racism, d support for divorce, that are profane in any way, not just with writing, because sometimes you have to form nonverbal things that are clearly communicating a message. Now, this got out on social media, what Jack Phillips had done. There was a boycott that was started. Another baker immediately volunteered to do a cake for free, which the couple accepted and used at their wedding ceremony. And one of the things that was significant about that is when they cut into the cake, the big reveal was that rather than having like chocolate or white batter, it had rainbow batter. Now, I want to be clear that they didn't reveal that part to Jack Phillips. He turned them down before that fact came out. But we put the pictures into evidence of that at that point in time in the, uh, the reception where they come in and cut the cake and feed each other. It's clearly rainbow batter that's, that's going on there with all that. They filed a complaint for discrimination, sexual orientation discrimination, by a public accommodation with the uh, Colorado Civil Rights Division, which found them guilty. And the, uh, the administrative law judge, the commission affirmed this, and so did the Colorado Court of Appeals. And they all basically, their opinions all basically say the same thing. They rejected the argument that uh, Jack Phillips turned them down because of the message communicated by the cake as opposed to the fact that they were gay. And uh, this was rejected as a distinction without a difference, and, uh, but they did go on when they were confronted with some evidence that uh, during this time, and this was not at all coordinated by ADF or whatever, a Christian man went around to three bakers and said, would you make cakes that are offensive to the express opposition to same-sex marriage? And these three uh, bakers said no, and there was a complaint filed, and the commission said, well, that's different. That's not creed discrimination, which uh, affects all areas of religious belief and practice, because they were turning down because to the bakers, the ideas were offensive. And, and here, in Jack Phillips' case, he's discriminating based on their sexual orientation. And that incoherent distinction, if I can editorialize a bit, has just persisted throughout the litigation. We appealed to the US Supreme Court, and, uh, and, and I should say, when they rejected the other religious groups, that they rejected that they said, therefore, both free exercise and free speech are not affected because you can turn something down because it's offensive, but not because on a prohibited basis under their law. We appealed to the Colorado Supreme Court. They said they did not hear the case. And then the case lingered for about uh, nine months before the US Supreme Court. For those of you who are familiar with Supreme Court process, I think we were relisted something like, and I should have counted, I think it was at least 16 times. Uh, or what, what? 19. 19 times. It was, I don't know if that's like the record, but it's way, 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 way uh, beyond what they normally do. And that's significant because the Supreme Court basically has to affirmatively act to delay a case to the next conference. It's not like a normal meeting where, oh, we didn't get to that agenda item, we'll just kick it over to next week. They have to affirmatively say, we're moving it. If it's not moved, it's automatically cert denied. So the fact that they, they kept going and going and going, and first we thought, well, maybe it's we're waiting for Neil Gorsuch. He got on, nothing happened for a couple of months. And then on the last day of the term, their last orders listed at the end of June, they granted review. What's going on there, I'll just say, I don't know. Uh, except that uh, there's four of them that are interested in hearing the case. Uh, one thing that uh, we're just internally, or at least this is what I'm saying is, I do not think that they granted review in some sort of let's do a final solution and crush these Christian dissenters once and for all on marriage equality. Uh, that's not how the Supreme Court uh, normally operates, that if the lower courts are doing the dirty work, there's really no circuit split on this. Uh, they just uh, are granting review, I think, uh, because it's a significant issue that we have a point and, and that the people who just are dismissing this out of hand uh, have to consider that a Supreme Court cert grant is not easy to get. And we're definitely not bamboozling Justice Kennedy or something like that. They think that there's something to our right of conscience arguments, even though they're being framed in both a free speech and a free exercise context. Let me just use my remaining minutes just to make a couple of quick points about this case and the significance of this and the way it gets distorted by our opponents. First, 
The case and cases like it, the photographer and the, and the flower case, are compelled speech cases, not denial of service cases. So this isn't like, we don't serve your kind here, you're gay. None of these cases are that way, even though it gets presented that way. These are all situations where everybody, every one of, the, uh, of these uh, defendants, uh, these Christian business owners, I know many of them personally, I've been involved in about all of the cases, say we will serve gay and lesbian customers, we just don't want to participate in the wedding ceremonies. And if you don't believe me, listen to the words of Professor Estridge from Yale, uh, William Estridge, who wrote in the New Yorker last March, just six months ago, this, where he basically agreed with this. And, and he's a strong supporter of same-sex marriage and gay himself. Fundamentalist Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox Jews, Muslims, Mormons, it's a big chunk of America. Decent people. They feel they are under siege by the government. Many have no problem with gay customers. They just don't want to participate in the choreography of gay weddings. So that's the first point. This is not a denial of service situation. The second point I want to make is that there are some for-profit businesses that basically engage in expressive activity that's protected by the First Amendment. And they don't automatically surrender that protection simply by entering the marketplace. Now, the Washington Post and the New York Times allegedly are for-profit corporations. I, I, their balance sheet may not look good, real, but, but they are <laughs> private corporations trying to earn a living. And when they brought, for example, the Pentagon Papers case back in the 1970s, the government say, oh wait, you're a for-profit corporation. You surrendered your First Amendment rights at the marketplace gate. You lose. The, the, none of that came up. It's not like the First Amendment protects you know, the, the, uh, the underground alternative paper that's handed out on the sidewalk for free, but doesn't protect the Washington Post. In the same way, simply because someone earns a living doesn't mean they've, they've forfeited their First Amendment protections. Uh, so that, that's the other th a point that, that I want to make here, is that corporations who are inherently expressive, and you think about this, designing a website, uh, writing a speech, even doing tattoos are for-profit businesses that express ideas, and they should be protected. Then also, I want to stress that cakes and ceremonies using cakes communicate ideas. Birthday parties, graduations, gender reveal parties for the, the mom. You know, what, what sex is the baby? You can imagine some liberal baker objecting to the fact that uh, being made to make a pink or a blue gender reveal cake. And this cake obviously was communicating messages because it's an iconic part of a ceremony that you have at a wedding. So it's not the wedding ceremony itself, but frequently in American culture, the guests are hanging around at the reception. This, the couple walks in and there's a big cake there. Now it's not a pizza, it's not a pot roast, and they use the knife to cut the piece and then they feed each other. And in this case, it was rainbow batter that was being exposed. Now, I think if you interviewed 100 people who saw this nonverbal ceremony going on, they would say, and said, what is it communicating? Is it communicating, I'm hungry and I need some cake? Or is it communicating, we're a same-sex couple and we're just as legitimately married as a man-woman couple, and this is supportive of gay rights, hence the rainbow batter. I think the message is clear, and to deny that and say this is just a denial of services, I think misses the whole point. Uh, just uh, let me just wrap up with one point so we can hear from our others, is that one of the things when I go and speak about this case at campuses, I feel that the, one of the, the assumptions are something like this, and this to me is, both of these assumptions are very dangerous. I would have baked the cake, so therefore, I have no problem with the government exercising coercive, punitive power against Jack Phillips, the photographer, the florist, etc., because they're just a bunch of bigots. And I want to say, okay, what you're assuming is is that 
you will never ever have a conflict with a government rule forcing you to express an idea you don't agree with and that it's fine for the government to punish others mainly because you agree with what the government's doing but what if you don't don't you want those first amendment protections there to protect you that to me is what this case is all about and that's why after we have oral arguments probably in the last week in november or the first week of december it hasn't been set yet uh, and then we'll get a decision a number of months later i think there's going to be a much solid majority supporting the right of conscience in this case thank you very much Thank you, Jordan. <clears throat> so uh, I work at the Texas Solicitor General's office, and we have gotten the opportunity over the last few months uh, to do a couple of briefs in on on these cases that that Jordan was kind of outlining for you. We've got uh, we have a florist in in Washington, uh, Baron L. Stutzman, who was was not only forced out of business because she wouldn't uh, arrange make flower arrangements for a same sex wedding. Uh, but they've actually come after her in her personal capacity as well, and so it would it would completely uh, bankrupt this this uh, lady and her husband. They would lose their farm, uh, everything, because it, it there there's a bigger issue here that that we'll kind of get to in a moment. But it's it's more of a, a the other side seeking to impose an orthodoxy, right? Like not just looking for the the buzzword you know, that we heard for the last decade or so was, was tolerance, right? That you would be tolerant of my views. But we're actually seeing that, that that's not where, that's not where the, the line was going to be drawn. <coughs> that's not where it's going to stop. Uh, and so they're going to, going to keep punishing un until the Supreme Court stops them. Uh, evidently, some of these state courts are going to continue punishing uh, individuals that won't <coughs> again, they won't, maybe they won't uh, make flower arrangements, maybe they won't bake a cake. Uh, for a same-sex wedding. Um, so we did, just the other day in the office, we got an arrangement from Baron L. Uh, Sussman from the Arlene's Flowers case. Uh, it was really beautiful. Uh, I'm hoping Jack Phillips maybe uh, takes some notes from her and, for, and uh, sends, us, sends us some baked goods. Um, <laughs> but, so, I, I got to, to work on these, these briefs. Uh, we, we filed them with the Supreme Court. Arlene's Flowers is at the, it's still <coughs> at the cert stage. Um, so we, we suspect that the court will just hold that case uh, pending the outcome in Masterpiece Cake Shop because the issues are, are identical. Um, and so we got to do these, these briefs on behalf of, of several states. Um, we focused primarily on uh, the freedom of expression issue, right? So, so there's two lines of doctrine going on here. Um, the, if you look at the First Amendment, you've got freedom of religion, as mentioned first, and that's, we're going we're gonna to talk about that quite a bit, I think, here in just a little bit. Um, but, of course, there's just the freedom of expression, freedom of speech. Uh, we wanted to focus on that line of cases uh, and, and that doctrine uh, specifically because Justice Kennedy is... Uh, such a free speech absolutist, um, and felt like that would be that would be important in in reaching out to to him. Um, if you look at these cakes, so maybe your first thought here is, well, you might you might have two thoughts. One is you might be like one of our staff people that I was talking to about this case, and and she's like, well, why didn't he just bake the cake, right? Like, I mean, that seems kind of rude like why he he should just he should just go ahead and bake this cake so maybe you have that thought or maybe your other thought is that well we're talking about about cake here and in fact the the federal government was debating whether or not to weigh in but they were like you know if you have a sheet cake or if you just have some cupcakes or whatever how is that expression at all because you're you're thinking that you know if this is expression right then then everything's going to be expression and you know the the chef on on TV is going to be able to to tell people that no I won't cater your same sex wedding because my food is art right but uh, I, I would say a couple of things one actually if you look at these cakes if you look at, at what's being produced it really is is artwork and I I tend to classify that as as anything that I can't reproduce myself not <laughs> not, not not being an artist <clears throat> but uh, 
but you, you look at, at what the Supreme Court has considered to be art, um, some of those things, and uh, I think the, these cakes definitely definitely would, would be protected. Uh, what's important here is that the Colorado, uh, the Colorado courts confused, uh, well, they confused a, a couple of things, but one, they confused this line of cases that says you have to, the, when, a, when someone is attempting to deliver a message, uh, the, the, the audience has to be able to understand that message, okay? So if, if I came up here and, or well, or if I, was, uh, if I was going to school in the 60s and I wore a black armband, people would understand maybe that I was protesting the Vietnam War or something like that, 70s, I need to work on my history. <laughs> 60s, um, 1960s. So, the, but, but, but part of this, this line of thinking is that your audience should be able to understand it. And they were like, you know, look, Jack Phillips, you, you have no, you have no, no beef here with, with what the, the state is attempting to make you do because nobody's going to, to think that this is, um, really your endorsement of a same-sex wedding. You just bake the cake, sell them the cake, you know, no, no, no big deal. Uh, but, but that, of course, is not how, how the Supreme Court uh, authority actually works in, in this area. Um, and when it comes, when it comes to art, uh, the court has said, you know, you could, I don't know if you've ever seen a Jackson Pollock painting, um, the you know modern art I, again that that looks like something I could do right but <laughs> but but the, the Supreme Court has said look it, nobody has to understand this it could be like Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky poem or it could be uh, there's a some famous composer that does these atonal compositions that just sound horrible right and the, the Supreme Court says look this is all art too this is protected so if these things are protected then you know, Jack Phillips literally painting on these cakes. You know, it it looks like a, a, a tapestry almost. Uh, that that would be that would be art. Um, also, as Jordan was was alluding to, or well, or saying, there is an expressive uh, conduct element uh, when you when you make these cakes or when you you arrange these flowers and you go to the the ceremony. You you become involved in the the ceremony and you are expressing. Um, uh, you know, it, in the, in the, the baker, the florist eyes, that they felt like they would be expressing their approval of the uh, the event. So it'd be you know, kind of, they would be complicit by their their participation in what was going on. And of course, we know uh, the Supreme Court has said over and over again, if there's any fixed star in our constitutional rights, the that constellation of of rights, it's that the government cannot compel speech from you they can't they can't make someone do this and so that's you know, the 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 lady that I was talking to at the office you know she's like well, why didn't he just bake the cake and I'm like, well you know step back and and think through what that means what does that mean for uh, again because I I understand that that people may be offended or may have harm a dignitary type harm if someone tells them no that I'm not going to bake this cake for you I'm not going to to let you use my facilities for a certain uh, for your same-sex wedding, but at the same time, the people on the other side also have a, a dignitary harm and, and that right. And I was like, you know, step back and, and look at, at what compelling speech does here. Um, so that was the the primary argument that we were focused on, were the the doctrinal lines of, about freedom of expression <coughs> in, in our brief, because I, I think I was talking with with. Uh, Professor Munoz, uh, just a little bit earlier, I think that that that's how the court is going to decide the case. Um, you know, if I had to to predict, I would say seven two, probably. I think it'll be it'll be fairly be a fairly easy win in this case, but it's going to be a narrow win because it'll be on free speech grounds. I think there's a there's a bigger issue though here, right? And I, and I think that that's what John is really going to want us to, to talk a lot about is that. This is really about uh, freedom of religion, okay? Because you know, to to borrow to borrow Robbie George's uh, book title, right? A, a clash of orthodoxies, right? What what people believe about about how the the railroad should run, um, and so this this freedom of religion uh, idea has been 
it's been kind of running in the background in these cases, these the same-sex marriage cases. At, at first, Justice Kennedy told us that if you, uh, you know, were against same-sex marriage, that you were a bigot. Um, but then, a couple of years later, he dialed that back a little bit and said, you know what, I, th I think... Uh, you know there is room for for disagreement in this area. Uh, people of good faith hold different views on these subjects, and you know because they kind of have for you know a, a long time. So uh, there there is room for that for disagreement in this area. And so again, we we saw that that this was coming um, this clash between the the right to to have a same sex marriage uh, and the the right to avoid uh, being compelled to to participate in that, um, it so when when we put together our our brief and we started collecting um, signatories to that, like other states joining joining with the state of Texas, um, I think it's always interesting to to see. You could you could look our, at our brief, you could pull it up online, and you can see which states are not there, right? Um, the I'm the people's Repu the people's republic of, of <laughs> California. Uh, <laughs> Did not join in our brief. Uh, in, in fact, I didn't even ask them. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they, it's interesting to see who's there. Now, there are a few states, too, that are, as you might suspect, are kind of on the fence about it. Uh, if, if they have an attorney general that may or may not be announcing his run for governor this week, uh, you know, they may not have joined because people people saw this as as you know, oh, it's this is a same sex marriage case, right? They saw it as another one of those, and we, you know, we're trying to explain to them, no, this is really this is a First Amendment case, right? Um, but uh, one thing that that's I, th I think we should note is that um, it, as we discuss the 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 freedom of religion here, is that that claim it currently is not as strong as as it should be again which is why we focused on the the freedom of expression um uh, piece now it there there's kind of a long history to that uh, some back and forth between the supreme court and and congress um but basically we have in america a religious freedom restoration act right like the that was passed in order to to protect um people people's exercise of religion. not not just their not just their beliefs but actually their to their conduct how how they behave in public um, but this this is actually the Supreme Court told us uh, that Congress didn't exactly have the power to pass that for the states right so so that's what we're seeing these come up through state courts uh, because you know it's a state of Washington in Arlene's flowers it's a state of Colorado uh, here it was the state of New Mexico in the Elaine photography case that, that Jordan mentioned earlier um, uh, the the states are are actually uh, applying the heat in these cases and so we don't have the the protection of the religious freedom restoration act um, and so uh, two two more points I, I just wanted to, to make I thought of while, while Jordan was talking um, both related to the, the fact that the, not only is this not a a public accommodation that we're talking about in these cases there's no discrimination going on um, you know in in this case Jack Phillips would would have made them or sold them anything except a, a wedding cake um, Baron L Stutzman in the Arlene's flowers case uh, would have done any flower arrangement uh, except for a same-sex wedding she in fact she had the her the person that that ended up you know suing her there uh, was a longtime personal friend uh, she Baronell employs uh, LGBT uh, individuals and so the, these cases are not about really discrimination and, and in fact you can see that in the current case in, in masterpiece cake shop it, it kind of and and maybe on this point we even get it to, to nine zero. But at the time that Jack Phillips said he wouldn't make the cake, the the act that he's being persecuted for, well, not prosecuted, but um, at, at that time the state of Colorado did not allow same sex marriage. So they the they would they had to go to Massachusetts to get married, and then they were going to come back to Colorado. 
and and have their wedding reception. It's, it's just astounding to me that, that the state would have this authority. The state had its anti-discrimination statute in place, right, in... 2012 is that Jordan when, right. when this started the, that anti discrimination statute was our, was in place, but yet at the same time Colorado didn't allow same sex marriage. Evidently, Colorado could draw a line at that time between discrimination against someone um, because of of same sex attraction versus uh, not allowing same sex wedding. But now because Jack Phillips would not help them celebrate that uh then uh basically 40 percent of his business has been taken away he's been ordered to to catalog every single time he says no to someone that he won't make them a cake uh he has to catalog that for the the state civil rights commission and he has to to have his employees which i think include even family members and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, he has to re-educate them on the the fact that uh, same sex marriage is is good a good thing and and that they should they should have to support that and so uh, the yeah, I think the the state is really overreached here and and they're not on on very solid footing so I I look forward to a reversal in this case I, I think there are there are some bigger issues that are that are looming out there we still um, maybe have to and and I think uh, Professor Munoz may address some more of the the uh, public when, when it gets closer to a public accommodation rather than than art in this case uh, so there are some issues looming but I, I'm looking forward to it to win in this case so thank you good morning uh, it's uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be with you this morning, thank you for coming, and pleasure to be uh, on a panel with three uh, lawyers whom <laughs> I have tremendous respect for uh, and, and uh, doing, doing extraordinarily important work for, for our country. Um, I, I'm especially pleased to be here this morning because uh, I didn't think I was going to be able to uh, when uh, Ryan Williams called and asked if I could uh, come out to California uh, on a Saturday uh, in September uh, yeah, like, look, I teach at Notre Dame. Those are, those are holy days of obligation. <laughs> Luckily, we play away, so I'm here with you. Uh, <laughs> uh, for reasons that were just articulated in both the, the previous, um, uh, by the previous panelists, I, I think we're going to win this case. Um, I'm not so optimistic that it'll be 7-2, uh, but uh, I think we can at least count to five. Uh, and I think it's going to, uh, the case will be decided on free speech grounds. Uh, I don't know that, on, on the expressive con content, that you can't force someone to express, uh, engage in expressive behavior that they, that they don't want to express. Uh, so I think that's how the case will be decided. Uh, and I can't add too much more to the specific legal issues uh, than what's been said already. So I thought I would devote my time uh, to try to articulate the underlying philosophical and moral issues that I think the case presents. Uh, the case is about free speech and it's about freedom of religion for sure, uh, but it's also about something more and perhaps even, even something deeper. Uh, the case, uh, I think, embodies the clash of uh, two fundamentally different conceptions of human equality and two corresponding notions of what we owe to one another as equals, as equal citizens. And so what I'm going to try to do is tease out these notions, uh, competing notions of equality and moral obligation, and then try to show how the free speech and free exercise elements, religious free exercise elements, follow from these deeper uh, disagreements. Uh, in, in doing so, I hope to show what's at stake, what's really at stake at the case, uh, how deep and fundamental the disagreements are and then to bring light to the looming threat to liberty that I think this case reveals. And uh, let me start by uh, just asking a simple question, sort of been anticipated in a way, but uh, how did um, Mr. Phillips harm the gay couple, Charlie Craig and David Mullins are their name, how did he actually harm them? Uh, what did he do to them? Uh, in, a, in one sense, in, the, in a literal sense, he did nothing. Right? He refused to engage in a commercial transaction. 
That he, he literally did nothing to them or nothing for them. Right? He denied a request to engage in commerce. And the denial itself, I think, if we think about it, was not really the harm. Because we can think of all sorts of reasons that if, if Mr. Phillips uh, denied to re engage in commerce, that would have been fine. If he would have said, um, I'm not taking on any new clients, that would have been fine. I'm going on vacation, so I won't be able to, pre to present a cake for you that day. Uh, I'm incapable, artistically, of designing the cake you want. For any number of reasons, he could have uh, denied to engage in commerce, and it wouldn't have brought up any legal issues. So it wasn't the, f the fact that he refused to engage in commerce. It was why he refused to engage in commerce. Specifically, it was the reasons why he refused. He, dis he refused because he did not want to participate in a same-sex marriage. And it was articulating that reason, basically by saying that he found same-sex marriages morally wrong and then acting according to those beliefs. That's how Phillips allegedly harmed Mr. Craig and Mr. David. Phillips' violation, in, if we describe it accurately, is a type of blasphemy. <laughs> Regarding sexual orientation, he violated the state-enforced morality of the state of California, um, state of Colorado, also California. <laughs> <laughs> like heretics of old, Phillips is being persecuted by authorities who seek to enforce their moral dogmas. Okay, blasphemy was persecuted because it was th thought to offend God. So we have to ask, why is the expression of a moral and political opinion, and then following that with corresponding actions, or in this case, a non-action, what harm does that do? Right? And when we think about the answer to that question, what we see is that there's a new understanding of equality that progressive liberals have adopted. Phillips, it is said, has assaulted the dignity of Mr. Craig and Mr. Mullins. He assaulted their dignity by refusing to recognize the legitimacy of their marriage and the moral propriety of their sexuality. In this new religion, it's the self, specifically the identity that we put forth to the world. The self is the new deity. Denying the recognition of this self is the new blasphemy. So Phillips is a heretic. It's a violation of equality because equality in this view means having one's moral identity affirmed by others. To be equal means to be recognized for one's own self-created identity, whatever that identity is. The act of recognition itself is necessary to the realization of equality. If one's identity is not recognized or respected or affirmed, then one is disrespected, to use a very awkward term. And one's equality is denied. Right? This is this new understanding of equality that's, that's present in the case. That's the equality that's being taught at the nation's law schools. The older understanding of equality was quite different. The older understanding, which is our founder's understanding, the understanding that animated our Constitution was that we are equal in our natural liberty, our natural God-given rights. We equally possess dominion to govern ourselves, and therefore dominion over our own labor and our property. That means that older understanding of equality meant that we could choose to contract, choose to labor with one another when we decided we wanted to. Equality in the older understanding was realized, as Lincoln said, in 1854 in Peoria, equality was realized by letting each man do precisely as he pleases with all which is exclusively his own. The older understanding of equality included a presumption of liberty. The individual is free to employ his labor, her labor, free to act according to his own or her own discretion. An essential aspect of freedom, of our equal freedom, was controlling one's own labor. Now, certain exceptions to this were always recognized in situations of monopoly or governmental licensing or governmental privilege. Then, when you're benefited by the state in that way or where there's a monopoly, 
we recognize that if you're open for business, you had to serve all comers. But that was the exception. That wasn't the norm. And our nation's history demanded that we make certain exceptions for race because of our original sin of slavery and then the denial of justice through state enforced segregation. But notice that those sins were sins because they denied the equal freedom of black Americans to own their own labor and to contract with those whom they, whom they saw fit to contract with. Again, these, were, these regulations were exceptions to our presumption of liberty. The older understanding of equality held that if you didn't do anything to another person, if you just left them alone, you couldn't harm them, and you didn't harm them. Expressing one's, oh, expressing one's opinions alone might offend someone, but in the older understanding, as long as you did not interfere with that other person's right to freedom of expression, or interfere with them in some way in their God-given natural liberty, speech alone could never harm someone. The new understanding, this new progressive understanding is different. Speech and the expression of opinions that fail to recognize the self-chosen identity of another inflict what is now what, what John referred to as dignitary harms. The speech that offends a protected class must be shut down. That's what's going on on our college campuses. Right? You can't speak because what you will say will offend me and in offending me, you deny my equal dignity. And businesses like Masterpiece <clears throat> Cake Shop that refuse to engage in commerce for reasons associated with protected identities must be fined and sanctioned. And what they really want is to shut those businesses down too. This new version of equality, that equality requires affirmation by others is incompatible, incompatible with our tradition, traditional notions of freedom. That is the single point I'm trying to convey. If my equality requires your affirmation, that you, you recognize and affirm me or approve me the way that I want to be recognized, then my demand for equality necessarily will direct and control the beliefs you can express. I will control your ability to speak Moreover, I will control what religion you can believe in. That's what's at stake in this case. I think Masterpiece Cake Shop is going to win. But whether freedom of speech and the free exercise of religion will be protected in the future depend on whether we as a nation can recapture and rededicate ourselves to the older understanding, to the Founding Fathers' understanding of freedom and equality. And that fight's just beginning. It, that fight will not be resolved when this case is over, and we must win that fight if we seek to preserve our freedom. Thank you. Now I hope you can see why it, the combination of law and political theory is such a powerful combination. Thank you very much. I, 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 I want to uh, make a couple of points. We'll have some conversation among uh, the panel here, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, first, John Sullivan made a, a wonderful thing. He got a set of flowers from Arlene's, and we hope to get a, birth, a, a nice cake from, from Jack. Uh, we once represented a client dealing with California's prohibition on foie gras, and I got to tell you, it's the best client I ever had, because when we won that, <laughs> won that fight, I got a whole case. Um, I want to play devil's advocate on your optimism about we win this case, and a little bit of inside baseball at the Supreme Court. Jordan referenced it um, at the beginning that this, they filed their cert petition, their request for review, in the summer of 2016. Um, the briefing was done and 19 consecutive uh, court conferences, they did not rule on the petition. That suggested to most folks um, that there was some kind of split on the court. Now, uh, it only takes four votes uh, to grant cert. And so, okay, so there were, it was 4-4 four, four, and they didn't want, they were going to wait for the last justice to be seated. Uh, a 4-4 four, four split at that time would have meant Kennedy was siding with the, the cake shop. All right, that was kind of the inside view. And that changed when Neil Gorsuch was, uh, was joined the court. Um, 
because uh, that would have been the, the, not the fourth vote necessary to grant cert, but the fifth vote to resolve the issue, and it would have likely gone in favor of the cake shop. But then there were another couple of months of relisting this case that is just inexplicable under that theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and that suggests to me, well, it's, uh, that, that maybe Kennedy was a little more waffly and that we only had three votes at the time to grant cert on the cake shop side, but but if what they were intending to do was kind of solidify that win for the left in the lower court with a Supreme Court ruling, as Justice Kennedy did in the first marriage case, the Doma case, uh, the, the, the plaintiffs had won that case in the lower courts, and yet they were allowed to appeal to the Supreme Court to get, get a greater precedential value out of it. Justice Kennedy, on this theory, is already with the majority, so why didn't they grant cert to affirm and be done with it before Neil Gorsuch even got there? I mean, these are very odd things going on at the court, and it's unclear um, why uh, one or the others of those things had not already happened before the end of the term. It tells me that one, we've probably got a solid four votes already against the cake shop, and that Justice Kennedy is undecided on how he's going to go on this case. Uh, and that means it could be five to four in favor of the cake shop, or if Just Ken Justice Kennedy, who is the author of the dignitary right language in the prior decisions uh, that, that Phil and John were talking about here, is kind of core to understanding this case from the other side, Justice Kennedy is all in on that understanding of equality, it may well be 5-4 the other direction. Right? I think that's a significant risk. Now, I, I hope I'm wrong about that, but I do think it's a significant risk. So let me pose that question to you all and uh, see what you think. And I, I just want to point out that John Eastman, uh, clerk for Clarence Thomas, so he's got, so he's sat around with a justice as this kind of inside uh, baseball was going on so let, let's talk like commentators before a sports game and Notre Dame is playing at Michigan State today if you were just to tie up that little loose end as to uh, uh, so uh, winning, winning. yeah <laughs> maybe they are you know I forget I, refer, I forget that we're displaced by three hours since I live in Washington DC so that's right so um, um, anyway so East Lansing is you know that's why he, that's why Vincent is here um, <laughs> the um, let me say that I don't necessarily disagree with, I, I think what John is saying is very plausible. And this is just very odd. It's about the one thing that you can say about this, what's going on. There, there are two things that I just want to throw into the hopper with all of this. And, and that is, is that they're really, uh, whatever we've said in the cert petitions, et cetera, I am not disavowing as an ADF attorney but it's really hard to say there's a circuit split on this issue. So the fact that the Supreme Court took this case, to me, indicates it doesn't like what it sees. And, and, and that's, and I, I kind of said that before, that they, they don't, and this, this it's, would be unusual to say, oh, by the way, we just want to affirm uh, and, and say we agree with the Colorado Court of Appeals on this rather than waiting as they did in the marriage cases for uh, the Sixth Circuit to go the wrong way, in a sense, and then they reverse to bring correction with all that. One statistic that backs it up, but we, you know, we could be on the wrong side of this, is that the Supreme Court takes a very small number of cases. Right now, it's about 80 out of 8,000 they get appealed. But of the 80 or so that they take, they reverse, and this has been pretty statistically consistent, two-thirds of the time. So if you want to impress your friends at a party, you can say, hey, you know that case the Supreme Court uh, granted review on uh, last week? I predict they're going to reverse. And you're going to look like Nostradamus because two out of three times you're going to be correct. <laughs> now, I think the one-third where they affirm tend to be, now, now this isn't always, but like where there's some where it's not a big culture war case maybe some statutory interpretation where the lower courts are decided. In fact, I'm going to see what John, if he has a thought on this. And that's where you could get an affirmance. This is not the kind of case that I would think they would take to affirm, that that, although anything can happen. The other thing that I want to point out was, and this is really esoteric, but you'll find this very intriguing, is uh, 21 years ago up in Chico, California, I got a call or, uh, from a 
widow who had refused on religious grounds to uh, rent a one of her one bedroom townhouses to a unmarried heterosexual couple male and female because that the, she would be uh, permitting fornication and that would violate her conservative Presbyterian beliefs and the California Fair Employment and Housing Commission basically charged her with marital status discrimination in a real estate context and um, it went all the way up to the California Supreme Court where we were raising religious liberty and we lost on a four to three vote at the California Supreme Court I do not think that would happen. I think we'd lose like 7-0 right now if that happened. But anyway, back then it was a different day, et cetera, et cetera. We appealed to the case to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court denied review in 1996. Or maybe in 97. It's, I, it was right around in there. Why do I bring this up? There was an obscure attorney working for the White House Counsel's Office named Elena Kagan. And when she was nominated by President Obama to be on the Supreme Court, I think it was in 2010, there was this release by the Clinton White House uh, archives or wherever they, however they have them, and including that, that Elena Kagan had written on. And one was a letter or a memo that she had written to her boss, uh, whoever White House counsel was at that time, saying, this Evelyn Smith case, I can't believe what the California Supreme Court did. They found her guilty of discrimination when she was asserting her religious beliefs, and then they just tried to crush her with all these damages and all this sort of stuff. We need to get the Solicitor General to write a friend of the court brief urging acceptance. Now, what she didn't realize is that the Solicitor General almost never writes an amicus brief at the at the assert stage urging the Supreme Court to take a case. They do their own cert petitions and then they hold back to do amicus briefs, which they've done in our case at the merit stage after a cert grant. And uh, but anyway, there is some passion that she has in this letter saying uh, that we should win. Now, that was 1996. This is coming back to me now. It was 1996 when she wrote this. 21 years, a lot of things have changed. She may have changed her mind, but uh, I'm not sure. At, at least we have this glimmer of hope <laughs> that Elena Kagan, back in 1996, understood the issues with quite a lot of fervor to the point where she wanted the U.S. government to weigh in and support basically what the Trump administration did in this case. So who knows? But that was a heterosexual couple. They're, they're, they're different. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Let's, let's open it up to questions from the audience. We've got about 10 minutes left. Yes, down here. We'll wait for a mic to come up. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, ordinary folks like myself, we're kind of used to something that's been called marriage for thousands of years. And going back to natural law, common sense, I think the bottom line is, is it's hard for us to believe that same-sex marriage is equal <coughs> to marriage. And that there seems to be something, some a moral conflict in this. And, and, and to force us to believe something that is a lie causes a lot of problems within the country. Um, so I, I, the, what is occurring now with the attacks on religious beliefs of marriage, there could come a time where we're going to put marriage back as a constitutional right and have 30 states approve of it. If we continue getting this, these attacks by the, um, the leftists and those who believe in changing words and actually coming out and saying, you have to believe this or this is part of the Constitution by one person's vote. It seems contrary to our traditions and the, the way Alexander Hamilton thinks, for example. What are, what are your comments on that? No, I, I have one thought on that, which is um, there is a very interesting debate going on uh, on the left. Now that uh, the, the progressive left has achieved w what they always said was their, their great hope to have same-sex marriage recognized as a constitutional right. The debate is <coughs> between uh, just for the sake of a better term, sort of the moderate left saying, look, we, we won, um, 
we 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 won you know the the more progressive left saying we won and now we need to crush our enemies now the moderate left is assuming that their enemies are all going to die off because all young people believe in same-sex marriage right so both sides think they're going to win eventually um, but this is a it's not clear who's going to win within this intramural debate on the left and it seems like the, the, the forces of uh, aggressiveness, which are reflected in, in the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, um, I, I mean, they, it's not, they don't care about Jack Phillips. They just want to use him to tell everyone else, don't dare act like he does. And, 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 we, and we should we should point out that it's not limited to the same-sex marriage context, and it's not limited to a business. So so uh, you know they, they they claim well this is if you're going to open a business you have to serve all comers, but this will never reach inside the pulpit. Well, not true. There's a guy and and his wife up in Idaho who run a little for-profit wedding chapel, and he's a minister. And they rent out their wedding. This is how they earn their living. They rent out the wedding chapel. And they were ordered to provide not only access to the facility, but since the access to the facility that they provide to others included him performing the ceremony, he was obligated to perform the ceremony. Um, uh, but, but beyond that context, uh, one of the scariest cases in recent years on this subject had nothing to do with same-sex marriage or LGBT, LGBT issues at all. It was the Stormans Pharmacy case. Uh, this pharmacist was ordered to carry, to stock and sell abortifacient drugs that were directly contrary to her religious beliefs. Now, it's not like the folks could not get those drugs at any other pharmacist in town. But he was ordered to carry a product that he found morally reprehensible or, or to be treated as discriminating against somebody in the exercise of their fundamental right um, to have an abortion. And so uh, th this, the tactics that were deployed in this context that have proved successful are now migrating over to other contexts for where ever since in that context, ever since Roe versus Wade, there was this kind of, okay, uh, we'll continue to fight to overturn Roe and you continue to fight to get it permanent and, and whatever, but we won't have federal funding and we won't have force doctors to perform abortions because that violates th their own freedom of conscience. That's no, that's no longer the, s the stalemate deal. This crush the opponent thing is gaining traction in a lot of the other, uh, other contexts. You know, I, I just want to add, I agree with all of that. that I, I think that's very insightful, is that if you think about this is the beauty and the wisdom of the founders in drafting the First Amendment and the other parts of the Constitution, is they understood the, this human tendency with our fallen natures to basically go towards these sort of authoritarian solutions to crush dissent. And that's why it's so important for, uh, and, and you see this, for example, in the, in the, the uh, Barnett case on the, the flag salute during World War II. Here, everybody was geared up to fight the Nazis, and you have to basically have a court that can resist the cultural tide to say, and we're going to protect uh, per, excuse me, protect dissenters and not say, you dumb Jehovah Witnesses, you're Nazi lovers if you won't say the, the Pledge of Allegiance. And we need mature, discerning justices to step in and say, we are going, to, the First Amendment says, we as Americans resist this, crush the dissenters uh, instinct that's, that's trying to be implemented here. Yes, over here. I was wanting your opinion on whether um, there isn't a problem with the weakness of Employment Division versus Smith in this, because the fact of this seems far more about free exercise than speech, and the, the speech argument has its um, weaknesses, and whether there's any possibility that uh, Employment Division could be rolled back so in a decision under this court. So, so from the former dean at Trinity Law School, a great question. Uh, so let, a, a real <coughs> quick, because we're running out of time, I want to get to a couple more questions, but real quick, the, the Justice, Justice Scalia back uh, 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, in Employment Division versus Smith said that the protections for religious exercise in the First Amendment um, are a lot weaker than we had thought. Uh, that, that, that what used to be the standard of review on restrictions on religious freedom was if, if the government was going to restrict your or burden your exercise of religion, they had to have a really good reason, a compelling interest. 
uh, and Justice Scalia said, no, if the law is generally applicable to everybody, like our public accommodation laws are, and it catches your religious exercise just kind of incidentally, then we're going to treat that like any other law. If there's a rational basis for the, the state's re regulation there, we're going to uphold it. And that's going to undermine your religious freedom, but that's just the cost of living in a democracy. All right, and, and, and then Congress comes back in with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to try and restore this heightened scrutiny to laws that burden religious exercise. And as it applies to the states, the court struck it down, said this is an intrusion on state sovereignty. And the reason we don't have the religious exercise cases, uh, claims as strong in the Colorado case is Colorado is one of the states that did not adopt their own Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, uh, so, so, uh, and, and it looked like Employment Division versus Smith was not open for revisiting as long as Scalia was still on the court. Um, now that he's gone, I think it'll be very telling to see whether the other justices, particularly Thomas, Alito, and now Gorsuch, uh, invite a revisiting of that issue. I don't think they'll do it in this case, but I could see that such an invitation in a concurring opinion or something like that to reopen that discussion. Yeah, the, I was going to say this. This case, though, does have room for uh, in employment vision, division versus Smith. There's an argument that both ADF and the, the states made concerning hybrid rights, is what it's called. So when you have your uh, free exercise claim, if you can pair it with another fundamental issue like freedom of speech, it can kind of enhance your your free exercise claim. So we, we've seen there's some allusions to that in, in Supreme Court case law, uh, but it would give them a way to to use Smith without overturning it in, in favor of the cake shop. So I would say in this case, no, they won't overturn it. Down here. Let's do a quick question there, and we'll go to the last question over there. This may be an unanswerable question between Jordan's optimism and John, your cynicism, <laughs> but... Look, the, the dividing line always seems to have been with Justice Kennedy. Yep. When he votes with the liberals is on social issues, and he votes with the conservatives on First Amendment issues. And I wonder whether the, the fact that uh, he seems to be getting close to retirement, is, is, this, a, a, is this a case where he's going to solidify his belief of standing with history on social issues like gay marriage? This is his case where he's going to go that way as opposed to his First Amendment jurisprudence. You know, I, I, since I'm in between. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I've thought that myself, but I don't think so for, for, for reasons that have nothing to do with the law. Uh, but there are some really prominent liberal thinkers who think that the cake shop owner should win on free speech grounds. So it, it's not... Kennedy, if, if Kennedy, and who knows what Kennedy's thinking, but if he's writing for his legacy, it's not obvious that siding uh, against the cake shop owners will, will get him this. I mean, I'm thinking of fellows like, and, I mean, these names won't mean nothing to you, but Andy Koppelman and Doug Laycock, really significant figures uh, are arguing, on, the, and the, on the, their four gay rights are on the left, <coughs> have written that, no, the cake shop owner should win. And so I don't think it's so clear cut for, and I think Kennedy pays attention to these people. If I could just add one thing here. I think Kennedy also, now this is more like I'm playing armchair psychologist. I think he likes to be sort of the moral arbiter of the universe. And he kind of sets the, you know, here's the, uh, here's the lines and everybody should just be happy with it. And so in, in the uh, uh, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, he said, okay, here's the line. There's some, you know, there's a, we protect the fundamental right to abortion, but there's a significant amount of state regulation going on. That's a little bit of an overstatement, but you get the idea. And I think that he is, he also looks at things where what's really going on here. The oral arguments will tell the story. I think he wears his opinions on his sleeves. He doesn't play devil's advocate. And I think in Obergefell, he felt like, the state's being mean. They're denying dignity to these same-sex couples. They have legitimate love that should be recognized. They have none of that going on here. 
they're basically they had a hundred bakers that would bake this cake for free and they're going they're singling out just like vincent was saying i totally agree with this and crushing this guy is an example to everybody else and i think when when he thinks in terms of dignitary harm i think this may backfire on the 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 gay rights supporters that they're they're inflicting dignitary harm on this guy by making him a public example of we're going to do this to you you know next if you don't bow the knee to our orthodoxy and i think that may offend kennedy's libertarian instincts and he say look you can't do this to these people you know and and, and that's why i think might be where he would end up so we would get more of a free speech win than a than a and, and they just wouldn't deal with the free exercise issue i i so hope you're right yeah. but um i've been i've been uh, disappointed by justice kennedy so many times because remember, it's not bending the knee to the LGBT agenda. It's bending the knee to Justice Kennedy's opinion <laughs> on the LGBT agenda. And he's going to take a dignitary affront if you haven't gotten in line. That's what I fear. I, I hope I'm wrong about that. But I, but I do think there's a risk, a risk of that. Last question over here. If, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm not an attorney, so I'm asking a question, though, that sort of Especially given the condition of how people are vilified today, you know, because of their beliefs, uh, is there any possibility for, for instance, that this could expand? Uh, uh, for instance, I support uh, Alliance Defending Freedom. I send them donations, and I support their work. Thank you. So, could I? <laughs> could it be extended to me and those other people? Yeah. That, that Only if you them. donate to the Claremont Institute, though. You <laughs> well, uh, I, I also do that too. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, but, but no, I'm just because but, we, the panelist is is but, involved with Alliance Defending Freedom. But could that extend to a person like myself or others that support organizations that are fighting for the cake shop? Uh, yeah. Person. Well, in in the uh, in the uh, Stormins case, no, it's not Stormins. The Sutzman case. Um, the Arlene's Flowers case, um, she was hit with a hundred fifty thousand dollar fine. She did a GoFundMe page to help, you know, get donations to help pay the fine. And then the state came in and 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 closed the GoFundMe page down. And said you're not allowed to get this from anybody else. Um, and uh, we we want to we want to crush you. Uh, and 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 we and we see the California Attorney General demanding access to donor lists in, before they re renew nonprofit status. The whole IRS controversy. All of these things are part and parcel of this radical transformation. Um, uh, from what was never really a live and let live ideology anyway on the left, but it's now becoming very clear that that's not what's going on. So it's it's as I said, it's it's much broader than these particular issues of what's and, at stake and here. Corporate power too, right? I well, mean, this is. Yeah. I mean, the the, the the high profile firings by Google and Mozilla before that, these were not just about the individuals, really. They were ab about setting the standards of what is appropriate to to scare people so they won't donate to yep. these groups because you'll be retaliated against I mean, and, and we have to fight against that right? and, uh vincent's very insightful thing that this is basically uh, a blasphemy case against someone who's not affirming the worship of self as somebody identifies i think is very very insightful and if you look at some of the other countries if the supreme court does not shut this down there's a dynamic these things are always moving so either right before or right after we have oral arguments, the Canadian Supreme Court's going to hear the Trinity Western case about whether provinces can refuse to allow attorneys that have graduated from the Trinity Western Law School to be licensed in their province because of the doctrinal belief of traditional marriage that the that the school holds. I mean, nothing about their ability to practice law, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Ontario has said... Uh, well, there's a number of provinces that have been doing it, but British Columbia and Nova Scotia have said this violates our equivalent to our First Amendment in our in the the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada. The Ontario Court of Appeal said, "No, you can do this. We got to wipe out all these uh, blasphemers." Well, they didn't put it that quite that way, but that was <laughs> essentially what they said. And the, and that's the one the Canadian Supreme Court has granted for review. And I think maybe they've taken all three, but they're going to argue that. On November uh, uh, 30th and December 1st, two days of oral arguments. Mm -hmm. England 
if you believe in marriage can only be defined as one man and one woman, you cannot have foster kids. They will. They would rather have the kids be in the orphanage or whatever they do with foster kids than put them in a home of somebody who believes in traditional religious beliefs about marriage. And so there's a dynamic an expansion of these kinds of things to basically get these heretics, you know, make them unclean and, and pushed out to the outskirts of society unless a court steps in and says, no, the First Amendment doesn't allow you to do it. So I, I think that that's going after donors. It's like their imagination. If they're not restrained, only their, the limits of their imagination and <laughs> how to persecute the blasphemers is, is what's going to go on. And I think that that's why all civil libertarians should step in. You can believe in Obergefell and same-sex marriage and still think Jack Phillips should win his case. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs> And if I if I am I am I kind of giving people directions or somebody could come up and uh, let me just make sure I've got the timing right. So we've got about ten minutes to make our way over across the street to the fourth floor of Beckman Hall, where we will have our luncheon and our awards presentation. Um, it's right across the street. Uh, there's four four stories worth of stairs. If you go in the front door here, if you go into the round of the back of the building, there are elevators. And I think we've got staff that will be pointing you in the right direction. Okay. And then we're coming back here after lunch. Okay.